Well, thank you very much, Basil, for this nice introduction. Thanks for the organizers to invite me here to present here on um, uh, therapy of factor loss with a special focus on smear training. So before I come to that, I'd like to talk about the plasticity on the effector system. This is what separates the effector system from other sensory system that it's plastic. Also, you have that in other sensory systems, but the special aspect of the sense of smell is that it's plastic is changing all the time. So this relies to, so that's the Rombo syndrome I have here. <laughs> um, well, it relies to affect receptors that have up in a nasal cavity and they are changing all the time. You lose olfactory receptors while, I'm, while you sit here, while you listen to me. You lose olfactory receptors and you're regrowing new ones. Estimates are that like every four months, you have a new sheet of olfactory receptors up in the nasal cavity. So every four months you have turnover. Uh, in rats it's even faster. In rats, estimates are it's like two to four hours, two to four um, uh, weeks that they have a new set of factory receptors. So there's constant turnover. You might wonder why is that necessary? Why do we need that? I mean, it's a complex process. It involves <laughs> lots of things that we even don't understand, how factory receptors are grown and they need to establish the same uh, contact in the affected bulb as the precursor of that neuron. So it's a very complex process. And still we have to do that because probably the olfactory receptor neurons, they're exposed to the environment in a very specific way. They're sitting in the nasal cavity. They're directly exposed to toxins and dusts and whatnot. And so if they wouldn't regrow all the time, we probably would lose our olfactory abilities very soon. Within that constant turnover, there's also uh, a change um, of olfactory receptors. So the basis, I trust you know that, we have a basic set of 400 different types of factory receptors, about that size, and we differ in that. So maybe I have like 250 types of factory receptors, and you have some 250 types, but they are slightly different. We overlap to some degree, but there's also some differences there. Um, but in that uh, individual aspect of effective function, there's also a change, for instance, during aging, we lose olfactory receptor neurons, as you can see here, with aging, that's work from uh, Verboigt and co-workers. He looked at olfactory receptors uh, across lifetime. What you see here is the dark areas, they show full expression of the olfactory receptor, and the lighter the green is, the color is here is, the less of the receptor is being expressed. And that's plotted against the age of the subjects, as you can see, as we get older, we lose many of the olfactory receptors. But not everything is going down. Also for these receptors down here, of that set that has been investigated, you see an increase in receptor expression. So again, with age, they are changing all the time in our olfactory receptor expression. Uh, the other work here from our group, when we looked at people with specific anosmia, these are people, every one of us, as I said, we different our olfactory receptors, and every one of us has specific odors that each one of us cannot perceive. So each one of you has one or several odors that you cannot perceive or you need it at a very, very high concentration. Examples for that are lural or this cedral methyl ether or musk odor or peontyl decanolid, and we use these people who are initially very insensitive to these odors. So we've looked at regular population, these are students actually, and they were able to perceive the odor at super high concentrations. So this is like in very high concentrations of the odor, they were able to perceive it. And then we exposed these people to these odors, to these specific odors for a period of six months. And what you can see there, if these were healthy young people, and after a period of six months, they increased by a factor of up to 10 to 100,000. So just by the sheer exposure of people to a specific odor, you can increase the sensitivity uh, in a tremendous level. You've seen that has been around for a long time. It's, I think, almost 100 years that this is possible. But this is some, some proof of the pudding. So it's like 
And the same principle would be tried here in patients, uh, in healthy people. Um, you can also do that on a behavioral level, also in perfumers, for instance. That's worked by uh, Jane Ply Lee and Jean-Pierre Royer. They looked at the brains of perfumers, or professional smellers, and they looked at the olfactory bulb. They see that the olfactory bulb is larger in these people, uh, and also looked at the brain responses of these people with odors. They also are different from uh, controls. What you see there is, for instance, like these uh, perfumers, they need less brain activation to respond to an odor than uh, regular people. That relates to the old study that you, maybe you know this study about London cab drivers. It was one of the first studies on fMRI, one of the first fMRI studies. The studies basically is like in a nutshell, it's like you show not London cab drivers, you show them a map of London and look at brain activation, and they activate that much. If you show the same map of London to me, I activate that much. You know, for me, it's total chaos. I don't know what to do with that map. And if you're a specialist with that, you don't, you know, it's a little specific brain activation to deal with this situation. And the same is true here for people with uh, experience in a sense of smell. They also need much activation, need little activation in the brain to deal with an odor. So they have large olfactory centers in terms of volume, and they also uh, have a specific type of responsiveness in the brain to odors because they are smell experts, because they have been exposed to odors for such a long period of time. So again, this needs to show you that there's plasticity in the sense of smell. How about olfactory training? So we introduced this olfactory training to patients. First idea was to take like four different odors. It was rose, lemon, eucalyptus, and cloves. We base that on this scheme here from uh, um, Henning. It's a German physiologist from 1916 when he published that. This is how his idea was that he can compose the entire uh, world of odors based on six different basic principles. So he had these six principles. That was spicy, that was resinous, this was burnt, this is flowery, this is fruity, this is fouly. Um, and he was, he was wrong, of course, like <laughs> has been tried a couple of times, but it's not so easy like to base the world of odors on a couple of, on, on these um, principles. But we chose our odors that I showed you here, these odors here, we chose them, we chose one of the four corners of this prism of von Henning, of Henning, rose, lemon, eucalyptus, and cloves, and presented these odors to patients. And uh, we had a group of people who did the training, people who did not do the training, and that was the outcome after four months, that like in people who did expose themselves regularly to these odors, like about a quarter of them, they improved in our effective function, and people who did not do the training, they did not improve to that degree. There's also some improvement or some change over time. That's spontaneous recovery, what you also see in patients with uh, post-viral effective loss. There's also, interestingly, some people got worse, but this is because we don't have rats in front of us. We have humans, uh, and they also, some of them also decrease in effective function. So overall, that was quite encouraging, and after that, a couple of other studies followed. That was, these are results from a large study that was also sort of at least single-blinded. Um, we presented patients in a group that was multicentric, a uh, total of about 200 people participated. That's a subgroup of this, study. What you see here is this is the change of effective function over time, over a period of 16 months. The red symbols show you the change of effective function occurring normally without any intervention. So that's the spontaneous recovery. So it's also you see in many of the patients you see increase of the function. The blue symbols, they show you the change of people who sniffed odors at a very, very low concentration, very faint, almost not present, and you see almost no change. And the green symbols, they show you the change of people who uh, smelled odors twice a day, like almost uh, like four minutes across the entire day for a period of six months. And what you see here is that there's a significant improvement in these people who expose themselves to odors. It's almost uh, twofold as much of an increase that you would see in people with a spontaneous recovery. So it's an indication that there's something seems to be going on there. It has been also used in that study here, that's by uh, um, colleagues from Istanbul in collaboration with us, from I2 Altundak. What they did here is that 
Uh, they did the regular blood type the spontaneous uh, recovery of people with post-infectious olfactory loss. There was little change in that study. Uh, here you see the recovery of people who did some smell training with monomolecular odors, uh, just single odorants like, uh, like uh, eugenol, eucalyptol, uh, phenyl ethyl alcohol, and citronellal. And the blue symbols, they show you the uh, risk recovery rate of people who trained with uh, uh, like um, um, mixtures of odors. So these were more complex odors. And you see here, when people train with more complex odors, they also improve more to a higher degree. The idea is that you stimulate more olfactory receptors in the periphery, and you stimulate more regrowth on various levels. So another study uh, that's interesting here is that it comes from Greece. So from Yadonis Konstantinidis, sitting here in the audience. So that was in post-traumatic uh, of post-infectious olfactory loss. That's again a spontaneous recovery to some degree it changes. This is when people trained up to a period of uh, 16 weeks and then they stopped with the training and you see here that they, uh, there's some slight recovery after that after they stopped the training. And this is then uh, the, when people continued the training for another up to 56 weeks, then they even uh, increased significantly more than people who did the training only, who stopped the training after 16 weeks. So continued training also helps. Um, where does that come from? The assumption would be it has to do with the periphery, and the answer is yes, it has. This is like animal research. I don't go into the details here. Just to show this here, uh, we did recordings from patients with olfactory loss before and after training. We record directly from the olfactory epithelium the so-called electroolfactogram. These are electrophysiological responses that are indicative of responsiveness of the olfactory epithelium. This is what we saw here. This is how the responses can look like. That's the response that we saw here. Before the training, about half of the patients responded. And after training, our response rates were much larger, so indicating that something is going on in the periphery when people stimulate themselves with odors. So periphery has something to say. Also, you see changes on the central nervous level. You see changes on the level of the affected bulb. This is the studies of people, of healthy people, students actually. <laughs> actually, the, most of the scientific knowledge that we have is based on students in the age between 20 and 22, but different story. This is like what we had here is like we had students, we asked them to sniff, train themselves only on one nostril, on the left or on the right side. And they did this for six months. And our assumption was if they train on the left nostril only, then the olfactory bulb on the left side would become larger. And if they train on the right side, the olfactory bulb on the right side would become larger. What happened is actually the olfactory bulb on both sides became larger. What does that tell us? It tells us that if you expose yourself to odors, it does something to the periphery. And also the brain is doing something to the olfactory bulb. There's something also happening top down. It's not that only the peripheral input is important, but also the brain is doing something on the olfactory bulb. And this is what you see here. So a miracle occurs in the olfactory bulb is getting larger. You see that also on a brain level. You see all more connectivity here. That's worked by uh, Veronika Schaff's group. They looked at connectivity in people before and after smell training. What you see there is that connectivity increases. That's like part of a study that she did here. So uh, before I come to an end here, just very briefly, what else can you do? Uh, there can be many things that do not work. This has always been shown not to work in the sense of smell. Like zinc, for instance, has a little bit questionable. There's one study from uh, China showing that in post-traumatic olfactory loss, it does something. Zinc seems to be helpful. Um, in other the things that might work is cardiovirin, alpha-lipoic acid, corticosteroids. Recently was a study at ACAMS showing that maybe even in older people, corticosteroids locally applied might be helpful. I don't know. Um, there's something about uh, sodium uh, citrate buffer. A couple of studies have been around. Um, two from our group in Dresden, one from Carl Philpott. Uh, we currently are working on a study where we expose people for a longer period of, of time, for 14 days, to nitrogen our sodium citrate, see what it does. So this is open. Um, the other things that we tried is a local vitamin A, retinoic acid. It has a significant effect on the sense of smell. If it's applied in the kaitiki position, people lying on the side, that's work led by Eri Mori, also here in the audience. Thank you, Eri. 
Um, when people do that, actually the sense of smell becomes significantly better when you apply locally vitamin A to the olfactory cleft. What else? Uh, one thing that I would like to mention here is an olfactory implant system that hasn't been established, but the idea of that has been around for a long time. In 2014, I think, our, our Rich Costanzo already filed a patent on that. So before anything has happened, there's already a patent. I find it in a way uh, nice and funny, but there's the, uh, they think you're starting to do work in that area, and maybe there's promise for that in the future. So that I'd like to finish. Thanks very much. Thank you.